Video recordings of this podcast can be found on RaisingEquity.org and Raising Equity on YouTube. Welcome to Raising Equity. Hopefully you've been following this series, Podcasting Amidst the Pandemic, where we attempt to talk to people from different perspectives to let us know what we need to be thinking about during the pandemic and and how we can understand this time, which some are calling a portal, some are calling a pivot. And today we have with us an amazing scholar and a dear friend who is an expert in public health, clinical psychology, and the health of boys and men. Uh, She is the director of the Health Disparities Institute at University of Connecticut, Dr. Wisdom Powell. Welcome, Dr. Powell. Thanks for being with us. So I know this is like your wheelhouse. The health disparities is is your area. When we heard that COVID was coming our way and we knew as a country that this was going to be something we were going to have to grapple with, did you know what, what many, many folks are coming to know that we would see these health disparities so clearly? Absolutely. I saw it coming. And I'm actually surprised that people were surprised because health disparities, which are the relative differences and outcomes that are experienced by groups, actually have been around for a very long time. And the disparities that we see are largely reflective of deeply entrenched, um, you know, structural disadvantage, which has plagued our nation for, you know, generations, I would say. Yeah. And it's interesting to me because I've been trying to to think about language and help people understand that like what we're seeing isn't something about black and brown people, right? It's not yeah. something about race. It's something about racism. It's the structures, Absolutely. it's the access, it's the opportunity. And so I know you make the distinction between health disparities and health equity. Can you share with folks how you center health equity? Absolutely. Often when we when we're trying to resolve the disparities paradox, we focus explicitly on like comparing groups like we want to know, you know, do blacks live longer than whites or have it finally we reached a, a level of symmetry in our mortality and morbidity. And actually, to me, that's not the goal. I feel like dis- resolving disparities is a step in the pathway to achieving and advancing health equity, which really is creating a society where everyone has their fair and just opportunity to be their healthiest, healthiest, regardless of income, race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, and even where where you live, your zip code, for example. Yeah. And I think that's important for folks to really understand is because we get so caught up in, like you said, marking the disparities. And it's like, well, we're not surprised. And yes, we need to disaggregate our data so that we understand where we are. But the goal isn't just to mark the disparities so that we can just say, oh, well, it's a bummer. It's a shame. But it's around how do we get to equity and that that outcome, right? That path to equity is the work we need to be doing, right? Absolutely. And here's the thing. We can't really get to health equity without having a proper diagnosis, right? It's like any, if you think about medical conditions, if you're a physician, an MD, and you're, you're seeing a patient for the first time and they come in with symptoms, you're gonna wanna do some diagnostic testing to determine where the disease pathology lies. And having disaggregated data, data that is disaggregated by race, ethnicity, language, preference, age, gender, actually allows us to see fully where the disparities lie and to be able to mount more effective interventions that are tailored to to that specific population or subpopulation. And that's why data is the most important uh, uh, weapon in our toolkit to not only reduce disparities in the in the midst of the pandemic, but to reduce them post pandemic as well. And that's that's key because I I, I tweeted last night uh, about people who are often are like, oh, you're you want disaggregated data. You're making us you're making us label people. You know, can't people just be people? You're you're being divisive and. And it made it made me think about all the ways in which people have tried to push against disaggregating mm-hmm. data by saying, right. well, th- you're making race something that it shouldn't be. And d- aren't you, t- you right. know, you're telling us that we need to get to equity where everyone has equal outcomes. So then why right. in the meantime, kind of hands on hips, you know, are you forcing us <laughs> to right. segregate people? And it's like, because we we have created all of these opportunities on the basis of, like you said, race, gender, language preference, right. all of these these different social identities, we must, we must understand people's experience on the basis of those. And I, the example I sometimes use is like, if you took your car in to get, to get taken care of, you wouldn't be like, well, 
you know, don't don't mind the history of the car. <laughs> just just fix what's a you know, like fix it. No, we need to know that history. We need to understand how how the history has impacted people's experiences and and healthcare opportunities and maybe compliance or the barriers. And so it it makes me laugh and it makes me so frustrated. Maybe I laugh so I don't cry that people seem <laughs> so resistant to disaggregated data as if they don't want to they don't want to know the truth or they don't want to see it when that is the key if you really want to solve it. I don't do you have mm-hmm. you run up against people pushing back against disaggregating data? Everywhere I turn. And and here's the thing. I I think we have to acknowledge the elephant in the room about the power that lies in disaggregate uh, disaggregated data to um uh identify groups, right? So there, and we know that folks who are occupying uh, positions that are lower on the socioeconomic ladder, racial and ethnic minorities, immigrant populations, migrant populations, being singled out um, by data as a data point has led to, you know, increased threat, discrimination, um, stigmatization. I get that. I get that the resistance from from the side of those people whose identities are going to be borne out in that data, I get that resistance. What I don't understand is the resistance from folks who are in positions of power um, to, you know, who push back on disaggregated data. And I and I say I don't get it with air quotes. I, I do actually get it because when you when it's measured, what gets measured gets done. And once you put the data out there, then policymakers, um, systems change leaders, uh, decision you know makers have to actually do something about it. As long as you keep a problem invisibilized, then you don't have to do anything about it. If you don't know that Black folk are dying more from COVID nineteen than other po- people in the population, then you don't have to address it, right? So. Toni Morrison has this really eloquent quote, which I'm sure I'm going to butcher, but she she says something like, I don't really believe that people who invented race as a sociological construct should be the ones who have a right to say that we should no longer pay attention to it, right? Mm. Like you don't get to take race away at this moment. Um, and yes, as you noted, health disparities are not rooted in people's bio- biology or in their genetics solely. It actually is the byproduct of, of, you know, systemic dehumanization and dis, you know, disproportionate access to resources. It is the result of deficits or deficiencies in the places where people live, work, play, pray, get educated and get their health care. That is the root of health disparities. And as long as we refuse to look at the data, we also are saying to the populations of people who are affected that you don't matter. And that's problematic for me on many, many levels. And yet, as you say that, it it makes sense. The systems of oppression say that they don't matter. So when we think about right. Black folks and COVID, the system of white supremacy, supremacy, the system of white supremacy has said our bodies don't matter. Right. And so to ignore and to not want to see the data that mm-hmm. white folks in particular, but all folks like if you if we see the data and we and we admit that black people have inherent dignity and worth then seeing the disparity will right. call us if we're truly the egalitarian That's good right. meaning people that we say that we are it would require Absolutely. us to put resources right and energy in that direction right. so you're right Absolutely. i mean it it fits with the like with the illness of oppression right the sickness right. that oppression is that mm-hmm. we would want to claim to be good people, but then not be willing to do the work to see Absolutely. where these systems of oppression have have disproportionately impacted people, because that right. would actually show that mm, actually our systems in our systems, we haven't been good people. Absolutely. So it's like it's a and push it would and help. pull. It's a push and pull yeah. between like the individual and the system. Absolutely. And and here is the, the rub for me is that we have been designing solutions that are predicated on this presumption that health disparities are driven solely by people's behavior or behavioral choices. I mean, we just recently had the Surgeon General of the United States in front of a podium with a captive audience. And his message to brown and black people was, if you want to prevent getting COVID-19, then you should not drink, you know, smoke and eat fried foods, do it for your big mama. I mean, right. I get it. The pandering, you know, is is evident, right? But 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 what's p- more problematic to me is that it, it, it 
positions, um, you know, brown and black people as folks who are behaviorally like challenged as if, you know, we're we're making rational choices. And we know that choices are constrained by availability of resources in your environment. You can't tell a family to eat five fruits and vegetables if they live in a live in a food desert or a food swamp and expect differential outcomes. Like it's just ridiculous. So we're designing, you know, interventions that are, you know, you know, to meet individual or address individual behavior when a systemic intervention would do better. And like we're blaming we policy change and it's a victim blaming. We're totally exactly. blaming. And so that fits, actually. I mean, I, I guess I, I, I understood that, but I hadn't sat down to really understand how that pattern of behavior, it, it makes sense in the larger in the larger narrative that we try to yeah, systems. Yeah, systems are doing exactly what they're designed to do. Yep. Right. And in moments of pandemic, you get even more of a scarcity mindset sort of, in, you know, sort of in, we get entrenched in that mindset. I mean, we're out buying toilet paper as if we're, there'll never be another roll of toilet paper left because the sense that we're going to run out of things or we're not going to have enough. And that sense of not having enoughness gives people even more permission, if you will, per political permission to other, you know, people to, you know, to start othering uh, yeah. populations. Yeah. Uh, that piece around the blaming individual behaviors, right? Like I, I under, I understood it. I saw it, but I'm, I'm seeing how it fits in the pattern of oppression in a different way um, as on this, on this national level. And it's, it's sitting right next to people who, people who say they really deeply care or, or right. maybe it's my bubble of people who care. Right. And so w wanting them to see how, okay, we can care individually, but collectively, like the way that our system is built, it doesn't. And so how do we create different outcomes? And so that's where I want us to spend some time thinking like, so then what Absolutely. do we do? But before we go there, you said something I hadn't heard before. Food swamp. What's a food swamp? I know a food mm -hmm. desert, right? So you're in yeah. a space where you don't have access to quality food. What's a food swamp? Right. So a food swamp is actually where you where you're inundated with actually unhealthy choices. Ah. Right. Like so, you know, you can have a desert where there aren't any, you know, fruits, vegetables or healthy food around. But you can also be, you know, sort of living in the swamp of like bad choices of like alcohol outlets and more cigarettes and, you know, available nicotine, of you know, uh, products available, et cetera. Interesting. So that's what that's what we mean. And, you know, when you were talking about this idea that we, you know, are resisting, you know, sort of talking about disparities because we believe that, you know, for whatever reason, our biases. But here's the challenge for me. You know, I think that we are not thinking about and addressing disparities also because we lack um, a vision for how to resolve them. And that, 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 and, and, and it's a sort of thing that, uh, you, we face whenever we're doing equity work. It's like this myth of complexity, this idea that, you know, if, that there's this is such a wicked problem that if we try to tackle it in any way, we'll never be able to resolve it. And so we do nothing. So this is like this analysis, you know, paralysis that is really, you know, dominating our ways of thinking. And then the other, you know, uh, you know, issue, the elephant in the room, if you will, that's preventing us from, you know, moving on to health disparities in this particular moment or being resistant to it is this idea that it's, you know, that we're somehow distracting you know, folks away from the real problem. Like, why are we talking about subpopulations when everybody is suffering? But when in reality, we know from like leaders like Angela Glover Blackwell, that if we actually design solutions that are de designed to benefit the most vulnerable, then those interventions will likely better serve the entire population than if we were to do, to do it the other way around. So we are here again, confronting a common zero sum proposition where people think that if you focus on disparities and inequities, especially in this moment, that somehow we're not focusing on the entire population. But here's the thing, we're on course in this nation to become in 2014, by 2014, a predominantly African American and uh, Hispanic and Latinx nation. So we better get ready because we are going to have to serve populations that don't look like the populations that um, folks were thinking about when the Hippocratic Oath was taken. Right. So th we're, we're in a different place in our history and we we have to get ready. Systems have to get ready. 
um, if we're really going to to put um, an end to uh, disparities in our nation. Yeah, no, you're right. Uh, in terms of health equity, the first step is is d- to disaggregate your data so you know where you are. And that's right. One way that I've encourage people to think about it is kind of like the case study. You know, if there's mm. someone who's experiencing something that that is you is unique or is significant in some sort of way, you you take a real intensive look at their experience, right? And that right. that can generalize right. and that that's important that we trust that. And so if we right. see a subgroup suffering disproportionately, we should get real curious about what's happening, why uh, because we can't we can't be arrogant enough to think that that information might not help us, right. that we might not be in a similar position, <laughs> given how right. contagious this disease is, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. So what are the what are the other steps? We need to disaggregate our data as uncomfortable as it might be. We need to do that. And for some folks, even that's a big step to get the data, to ask the question, to collect race, ethnicity, gender language preference, all of those demographic variables. Mm-hmm. I've even seen some organizations, it's taken them half a year to create an infrastructure to collect that sure. data, to be able to disaggregate. Right. So I just want to, yeah. even though we say, oh yeah, disaggregate your data, that sometimes it's, it's not as easy as it sounds. Absolutely. Data disaggregation um, in a way that allows systems to align themselves is more complicated because every um, organization Um, especially organizations that are critical to the resolution of health disparities, have their own value propositions. There's also data inoperability issues. So if you want a system that collects data on this side to speak to your system, there have to be technical things that, that are worked you know, worked out. In the state of Connecticut, we were doing a lot of work around um, creating data, you know, the data infrastructure so that folks can share data across systems. Because it's also important that if I am seeing a person who's impacted by COVID-19 or other uh, disproportionate health outcomes, I need to be able to understand multiple aspects of their unmet need, unmet social needs. So I need to understand, do they have housing? You know, do they have transportation? Are they getting enough food to eat? Is there um, other, are there other social services needs that are unmet? And then those systems have to be able to talk to each other to align holistic, you know, interventions. And so the next wave for us is not just in sort of identifying the data, but connecting that data to actual resource, um, you know, resources in the community, trigger systems in, in, in electronic health records that allow people to know, oh, well, this person is tested positive. They also have these these unmet um, needs. Because think about it, if you're discharging a patient that you've screened for COVID-19 and you've said, go home and you know shelter in place to be well, you have to be assured that person has a home, right? I mean, that would be important, right? So these are the kinds of things we, we need to put in place. I agree with folks who push back on the data disaggregation as the next step who think, well, that's data doesn't really lead to action. Like, how is that going to lead to action? Like con- connecting that, those dots are, th- are really important. But I also want folks to know that there's power in having data produced and disaggregated in the right places. So data disaggregated by itself without any plan for how that data is going to be leveraged for interventions, both individual policy systems are is, is, is not useful. And so we are arguing for having those data be connected to um, in a way or aligned in a way that will trigger the uh, the distribution of needed resources to the people who need them most. Right. We also need to be thinking about um, how do we get um, testing for the entire population? I think it's kind of an embarrassment that people are being, um, you know, uh, eight, given the permission, if you will, to subjectively decide who gets tr- tested or not. And here is where um, we have the potential to exacerbate longstanding implicit biases that we know dominate even the best, the most well-intended physician's imagination when he's making a decision about a patient. And we cannot allow those kinds of biases to creep into decisions about testing and triage because, again, it has the potential to exacerbate longstanding um, disparities in healthcare access and screening that we know um, disproportionately um, disadvantage racial and ethnic minority populations. Yeah, that, you know, when you think about the testing piece 
and the fact that a large percentage of black and brown folks are our bus drivers, the folks right. who are working in grocery stores. And I think it was a Brookings Institute report that was saying like 20 to 30 percent of bus drivers are black and brown. Right. Like, Absolutely. And so if we're if we're serious about getting our country up and running, which is a whole nother conversation <laughs> around right. public health data and listening to experts. Wouldn't mm-hmm. wouldn't we mm-hmm. wouldn't we think that those would be the folks who should be centered in terms of testing, not the celebrities and the the folks who have, like you said, the the privilege to go shelter at home. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. And the and the most immediate impact um, of, of that type of thinking and and the way of uh, differential distribution of testing, the most immediate impact is on the 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 mortality and the morbidity. Right. So you 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 are likely to if if a person isn't diagnosed early enough that they can get the treatment and services that are available to them before ventilation is needed, then we're going to see many more deaths because just people, those people aren't being triaged and treated. But there's another unintended um, consequence of that particular way of, of, of responding to the pandemic. And that is that you, we, we stand, we run the risk of, of further deepening the, the really rational medical mistrust that that many brown and black folk have um, about you know health systems. You know we we have worked really hard in the field of health disparities and health inequities to unpack medical mistrust to really understand how it affects treatment decision making, decisions to seek care and re- symptom reporting, and we've done a lot of work on the ground to help you know. Black and brown folks feel a little bit more comfortable about health systems so they get the care they need, right? But we, if we build it and we don't deal with these, you know, these biases and we don't do something about this differential testing that w- that's happening now, then people will not come post pandemic. Yeah. And then we're going to see even more, um, you know, chronic disease, you know, mortality um, and morbidity in populations that are already shouldering the disproportionate burden of those outcomes. Yeah. So you're showing that is, that's my fear. Yeah. Cause you're showing like, see the system says it cares, but it doesn't really. So disaggregating our data, making sure we're separating our data by those subgroups, making sure that we're being equitable in testing what else do we need mm-hmm. to be doing to move towards health equity right now in relation well, to COVID? Well, we need broad sweeping socioeconomic reform here, right? Because the way we're doing the business as usual post pandemic will not work for folks who have been edged out of employment, folks who are uh, who are already underemployed and not getting access to employer sponsored health insurance. We're going to have to think about what's going to be our broad economic response to the pandemic, one that actually um, levels the playing field in a different way than we've ever thought about it. Because if not, we're we're going to have a population, subpopulation of people in our nation, our citizens who are scraping, I mean, scraping to get by in ways that probably we haven't seen before. Now, I'm no economist, but I know folks who are living paycheck to paycheck and who before this pandemic, if they missed one week of work, it would set their entire family back. So imagine we've just gotten $1,200 stimulus checks to folks. Um, by the way, we can have another conversation about that. But it's, it's you can imagine how um, how much work we're going to have to do to to rebuild um, economic prosperity or it, it, so that we can have this American dream uh, that that folks tell us is, is available to brown and black folks. <laughs> you know, I mean, I just I just think we have to have to deal with that. We have to figure out first, not just how many people are unemployed, but how many people are searching for work and unable to get it. What are some of the industries that are willing to expand their work labor, you know, workforce to incorporate folks who are now in need of jobs and especially folks who have been disenfranchised from employment for a long time, like returning citizens from our, you know, prisons and juvenile facilities, et cetera. And so there's we just have a lot of work to do around the socioeconomic conditions that this pandemic will produce. And I'm imagining that that links to health in a few different ways. One, we have most <laughs> yeah. people who are who get their health care through employee sponsored health care programs. Right. We we right. we've talked about doing things differently, but that's not mm-hmm. the case. And like in Missouri, we don't have Medicaid expansion. Uh, mm-hmm. And I'm I would imagine right. that 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 the unemployment also links to people's ability to just care for themselves, get the medicines that they need, the food that they need. And I'm sure there's a correlation there, right? Absolutely. I mean, there's a long standing literature uh, 
that has connected low socioeconomic status to poor health outcomes. And it isn't just um, that, you know, poor people are making bad choices. So let's d debunk that myth. It is that, you know, when you have fewer economic resources, then you're likely also to have less access to insurance. You're also less likely to have adequate housing. You're, you know, these are, this is, these are domino effects. This is a web, if you will, of poss you know, possibilities for creating disparities and inequities. And until we accept that, um, and address it with that framing in mind, we're always going to be thinking in terms of hierarchies and really protecting only a segment of the population's wealth um, and socioeconomic status while leaving so many other Americans behind. My hope, my hope is that people are seeing so clearly mm. these dynamics, the social determinants of health, you know, the ways in which people who we in St. Louis there was a big fight for 15 and across the country. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and mm -hmm. I'm hearing people talk about that fight for fight for 15, the living wage, whatever that is in your area uh, and saying like, now are you willing to give folks a living wage? Right. right. Like I'm, right. I'm hoping that that awareness, that opening remains. Um, but I think I've been thinking about these are larger, like you said, systemic broad changes. What right. can individuals do? What can we as individuals right. do to to help move us towards health equity? Do we need to be signing petitions? Are there or do we need to be connecting with campaigns that are pushing for this larger systems change? Are there things that we can do in our own spheres of influence? Well, the first thing I want to say to level set um, is that, you know, doing nothing now is also acceptable <laughs> because um, and, I, and I'm just being real because we're in the midst of a global pandemic and the push towards productivity and getting engaged and advocating um, when you have children running around you while you're trying to work and, you know, dealing for the first time with everybody being in the house with each other 24 hours a day. If you don't, you know, sign a petition or advocate, um, it, you're taking care of your family, that's enough. You so let me just me. say that. Right. With no judgment. But. If you have the bandwidth or some bandwidth to get engaged, then there are a number of things that you can do. The first is you can figure out, first of all, do an assessment of the lay of the land of your local um, political um, efforts to you know, affect COVID-19. Like what's the response strategy that's being taken up by your town, your city, your state? Figure out where are there levers within that response strategy that really speak to you and your level of expertise or your passions. And then I, you know, make a phone call, write a letter to people underestimate um, the power of writing letters and calling your rep, your local representatives to advocate. I'm not saying that it's going to, you know, change the tide immediately, but certainly your voice is warranted and important. The other thing you can do is to focus in on trying to make sure that the uh, systems that you navigate are aware of the larger uh, national efforts to disaggregate data. I mean, think about it, hospital systems and urgent cares and places or service uh, provision outlets are not thinking right now about the, like data collection. I mean, they're just trying to save lives. So letting them, you know, sort of softly educating them about, you know, this need and asking even when you go in for your own healthcare appointments, are on this, you know, are, is this hospital or healthcare center systematically collecting this kind of data? Like, do we have any data from this location about who's infected, who's passed away, like by race, ethnicity? Asking those questions can go a long, long way. I also think that we can um, volunteer, you know, if you are healthy and able to support some of the frontline workers. I mean, I, what has been um, devastating to me is sort of watching my um, health care colleagues, health center colleagues, um, sort of go into the, the vortex of this storm every day and have to come back out of that and, and live their lives and be with their families and, and, and pray for the best. Right. So I think there are ways that we can support, you know, our local um, health care providers and health system leaders to, you know, provide um, some layer or measure of, 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 of comfort and connection. And some folks in our areas have been sewing masks and, you know, sort of getting involved that way. 
I mean, there, there are a number, you know, of, of low hanging fruit ways to, to address this. There are many other suggestions I would probably have for policy leaders and legislators, and we can talk about that, um, at some point. But, but for everyday citizens, I think the most important thing to do now is to care for yourself and your families and to give yourself the space, hold space for yourself to feel the grief and, and loss and challenge of it all. And then when you muster up enough spiritual bandwidth, um, get get in the firefight in a way that speaks to your passion and expertise. And thank you for that. And then for those who are in, in positions of power and who have spheres of influence, could they connect with the Health Disparities Institute? Like what major, or I know Data for Black Lives, yeah. there are organizations that are trying to Absolutely. get this mass push. Absolutely. They can definitely connect with our organization. We work along with another partner organization in the state, Health Equity Solutions. Um, there are a number of folks around the country who are starting to mount this um, or uh, put out this call to action, if you will, for data. Um, and I would love to see a national effort, um, alignment effort um, across states or counties or regions where we agree to systematically collect the same sociodemographic indicators, which would allow us to do more uh, rigorous comparisons across states um, and counties and regions. That would be a, a dream um, to be able to have that data. And those who are in positions of authority and who can, you know, speak directly to or have the ear of legislative leaders and officials should be talking about how we build in a process for monitoring and surveillance and testing distribution that is more equitable and fair. I think we, I mean, we, we can do this. Like this is not hard. We're mapping the human genome. I think we can figure out how we can get testing distributed equitably to those who are most in need. Um, even setting up testing sites, uh, opportunities in low income, and disadvantaged neighborhoods would be a step in the right direction. This idea that folks have to get out of their you know, neighborhoods and get to a testing facility to get triage is utterly ridiculous in a nation where we know that many people don't have you know, reliable transportation. I, it just doesn't make sense. So those are things you could push for right away. And there's another issue that I think folks could immediately um, sort of start to think about or help legislative leaders think about, and that's returning citizens. The fact that our folks are who are incarcerated are now being exposed to COVID-19 um, without, you know, PPE or without, you know, testing or triage is really devastating to me. The fact that we have essentially buried a population of our citizens alive and we're and and doing nothing is just appalling in a nation that's supposed to be out be about democracy and freedom. We just had our first death um, of someone being incarcerated in in Connecticut. Devastating, um, and I'm sure you know sadly that that may not be the last. And so we need to be thinking about you know how we can protect those citizens because they're coming home. You know, and 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 for those that are being released early, even we need to be thinking about transition assistance programs for them. Yeah, no, you're right. And decarceration has been something that I've seen a lot of work on. But you're right. They need support after they come out. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. how are they going to get connected to health care? We know that there's a, a, oh, a significant disadvantage in health care access and, and, and um, acquisition of health insurance among people of color and those who are low income, and particularly among those who are transitioning from uh, 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 prisons and juvenile justice uh, uh, facilities. So we have to do something about that now, or we're going to see um, not even just, you know, uh, issues of mortality and morbidity among those people, but they're going back into community community spread. So it's yeah, we have a lot of a lot of work ahead of us, but it's possible, and that's the thing I want folks to walk away from this conversation, sort of hearing that this is we've been here before. The nineteen eighteen nineteen nineteen Spanish flu should have taught us something about pandemic management. Um, and and we are really at this same river twice. We have an opportunity to learn from those experiences and do something different um, and an opportunity to improve the outcomes for a pandemic that we know is still, uh, you know, gaining um, momentum as it moves across the country and the globe. One of the things I want to make sure to ask you, given that you are the president of the of the Division of Men and Masculinity of APA right now, 
uh, is to talk with us a little bit about the the way in which gender influences people's experience of COVID. So this is a really important question, and I'm glad you asked, because what we're seeing, not just in the U.S., but around the globe, and of course, these data are to be taken with a grain of salt because we are in the very beginning stages of measuring and monitoring this process, disease process, but we have noted that men have a higher likelihood, it seems, of perishing from COVID-19. So there's higher COVID-19 mortality among men. And many of those men are men um, of color. And so as we know, and again, the differences in health outcomes among men and women are not rooted just in people's sort of social and lived experiences, right? There, there really is something to be said about biological differences that matter here. Um, and not that they are the sole reason, but we should pay homage to them, right? So we know, for example, that male fetuses are more susceptible to miscarriage than female fetuses. We know that men have fewer um, immune fighting T cells and that they're more susceptible, it seems, to rapid biological aging. So there is a sort of biological, if you will, potential disadvantage that is in place already, which may explain why men live shorter lives than women on average. But if these differences were solely rooted in biology, then we would see similar patterns of morbidity and mortality across race, racial and ethnic lines. Every male at the age of 50 would be a you know, experiencing the same sort of disease pathology. We know that's not the truth. There's a little bit of gene environment or biology environment um, sort of connectivity happening here. And this is probably manifesting itself in what we're seeing now in COVID-19 mortality, higher COVID-19 mortality among men. But we also have to understand that men live, work, and play in social environments with heavy sanctions around gender role performance. And what I mean by that is that men and boys on average are often socialized to deny bodily signs and symptoms, to wait and watch um, before seeking health care, to actually not want to tell people when they're in trouble or in pain. And this has real implications for timely recognition of COVID-19 symptoms. If you are um, on average the kind of male who believes that he should keep his problems close to his chest, not t tell anyone about your troubles, push through, then you're likely to probably show up with, with a more advanced you know, disease state than someone who would get help sooner. So this has implications, right, for, for the triaging and early detection of COVID-19. So it's likely that those processes are working in tandem with biological ones to put men at greater risk. And here's the rub. Most of the men um, in our nation uh, um, and around the globe live shorter lives than women, but black men still live the shortest lives of all individuals in U.S. society. And that's despite a narrowing of sex differences, gaps in life expectancy. So we've made some strides, but we still see this differential um, likelihood of men, black men perishing before they've had the opportunity to live their fullest potential. And so I think any response that we mount in COVID-19, in the aftermath or in the presence of COVID-19 needs to take careful consideration of the gendered ways in which men and boys are taught to navigate the world and it particularly health systems if we're going to impact change. And we have to also address the particular, the potential ancillary effects of COVID-19's isolation on men and boys too. Um, and that includes addressing longstanding mental health um, issues that we know are disproportionately impacting men and boys, such as suicide completion. So there are lots of things to think about in this um, moment where we are addressing, trying to address the issue for the whole population and paying attention to those who may be more vulnerable to disparate outcomes. And I like that you brought that up because I also think uh, when people think about disparities and mm -hmm. equity, they automatically just think about groups that are historically marginalized. And so they right. wouldn't think about us needing to understand the disparities and how men are disproportionately impacted. Right. We constantly think about the way in which women have been systematically oppressed in the patriarchy. And that's real. And it yeah, speaks absolutely. to why we need to disaggregate our data and look across absolutely. not just 
gender, but also race and gender and look at those intersections so that we can really see what's happening. So like you said, all the way at the beginning to ha- so that we can tailor our interventions. And when Absolutely. we do that, we, we are able to address people's needs. It's kind of like in the education sphere, you know, people talk about, uh, do you teach to the middle or do you individuate, mm-hmm. you know, do you create individualized lesson plans and how many people pay lots of thousands of dollars for their kids to have access to schools where they individualize right. the lesson plan that they see That's their right. kid for the special snowflake that they are and <laughs> individualize the plan. Right. right. And right. why wouldn't we want to do the same thing when it comes to people's health? Right. Yeah. I mean, I, and yeah. And I get the resistance around a, a male focused health agenda. I mean, I know I, I'm a, I'm a woman. Um, I understand, um, you know, the fight that we had to sort of get women's health on the map. And certainly in a moment of a pandemic, no one wants to hear an agenda that's about men. I mean, in, in, in the aftermath of the Me Too movement, I mean, folks are really sensitive about gender, um, gendered issues and particularly about patriarchy, male privilege and power. And that's a real concern, legitimate concern. But I think this is the one place in which the male uh, socioeconomic advantage does not extend to a health advantage. Um, and, and we have to really begin to grapple with that unless we are trying to imagine a world without men and boys in it. Well, and it pushes us, though, <laughs> to really say if we're serious about equity and we're serious about saying, well, right. so many other marginalized groups, we haven't seen the humanity in who they are and we need to care for them. Well, we, we need to ask the question. And if the question right. is that men and men of color are disproportionately impacted, then that's where we need to have the the same drive for seeing someone in their full humanity, even if they're a group that we weren't expecting to see these disparate outcomes in, right? Absolutely. Then if, if not, we're doing the same thing that that powers that don't want to do the disaggregation and, and funnel the resources appropriately are doing now that we're saying we're frustrated about. Exactly. And if there was ever a moment for radical empathy, this is it. And this is an opportunity for us to display that, not just for men and boys and men and boys of color who are disproportionately affected, but all individuals who are in more vulnerable and medically underserved populations. This is the moment where we have an opportunity to show that we really believe that we are one nation and that we're stronger together. Absolutely. I appreciate your thoughts. If folks want to hear more from you and be able to follow you, how would they find you? So I would love if everyone would follow us on Twitter at... um, at Yukon HDI, H is in Harry, D is in David I, and also me at Wisdom Isms, W I Z D O M S I M S. And you can follow me with that handle both on IG and on Twitter. That's but great. please stay in touch and join us in this work because this really is um, village work. Absolutely. And I'm yeah. glad that you are in my village. Yes. And thank you again for this opportunity and for the work you're doing to raise equity and conversations about equity in our in in our country. I really appreciate you. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on Raising Equity. I hope you leave today understanding how health equity is the work. Seeing health disparities is a necessary part of it, but health equity is our work. So let's be on that path to health equity. And we thank you for joining us on Raising Equity. Raising Equity.